Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, Neil. Hi, thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you on the show. I mean, Maker's Site are tackling some of the most important supply chain issues for manufacturers right now. You know, taking on risk and resilience, sustainability, and product design all in one collaborative platform. And we all know that I like collaboration. So I can't wait to find out more. And I'm sure this has already piqued the interest of our listeners. So let's just dive right in. I mean, you're the founder of Makersite. And I always love to have founders on the show because you really get under the skin of a company when you hear the founder talk about exactly why the business was created and the vision they have. So talk us through that. What's your background? Why did you decide to establish Maker's Site? And how did you come up with the name? <laughs> Good questions. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I've been in the space for about 20 years. I was actually born in India, and um, there's a long story about why this this particular field was uh, a passion to me. Um, but um, if we fast forward a couple of years, I moved to Germany to study, and um, I um, I got into this field very, very early. Um, looking at um, looking at how do you how do you change the way we take make and waste resources on this planet right it, it wasn't so much about carbon this was this was before carbon was a was a big thing um, it was more really about looking at how we're how how much we waste from what we mm -hmm. create and what we extract in the environment and how you can change that and um i think the the problem for me fits squarely in the hands of people who make stuff mm -hmm. very often we direct attention to how we use it but it really isn't right if uh, you drive a car you're driving a car that was made by someone who made it and so right. it's their responsibility to make the best car you can drive um it's not it's not for everyone to, to say you should walk i think you know it's probably healthy and stuff like that right but but let's not direct <laughs> we, buggy, you know <laughs> we shouldn't direct responsibility away from where it happens and i think that's what make a site um is about it's about helping companies that make stuff make it better and it's a place you come to to understand your product and what the implications of your design choices and, and buying choices are on the impact that you have on the environment, on the impact that you have on its cost and uh, what that means to society at large. Absolutely. And we all know that that's a really big discussion. I mean, it's how the product's made. It's also how consumers are buying mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. as well. How did you come up with the name of the company? I mean, it's... I kind of, I, I can kind of get it, but I'm uh... just asking. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was this right so we wanted something we wanted something simple we wanted something that um that is not uh, that that you can identify with the core of what we're trying to do it's a place where you come to make stuff right or to mm -hmm. get insights on how you make stuff and um the category we 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 operate in is product lifecycle intelligence right so it's about products it's about what you make and it's about thinking about this across that entire the, the from from cradle to grave as you call it right it's from mm -hmm. from when you pull it out of the earth until it goes back into the landfill uh mm -hmm. if in in the worst case um and being smarter about that so that's that's the the idea behind behind make aside and its name it's so simple i yes. love the name and uh I'm I'm just so happy that we're talking about what you're doing and how we can really help with the impact that we're making as an industry. So Makersite was founded in 2018 mm -hmm. and a lot has changed since then. So you were tackling, I would assume, particular challenges back in 2018. What are you seeing in 2023? Are those particular challenges, and maybe talk us through some of those challenges, are those still around like are those the challenges that you're still tackling or have things changed i think the the problem and i think is what is what is fundamental about maker side right it's enabling decisions and you're making decisions back then and you were making you're going to be making decisions for the foreseeable future and uh, yes. these decisions <laughs> that we like to focus on happen in in three groups uh, within companies the first is product development teams uh this is where you're deciding what to make uh, and, and how to make it, right? What materials to use, what technologies to use, and so on. Uh, the second is in procurement, which is where you're deciding where to buy from, whom to buy from, how much mm -hmm. to buy from. Um, 
uh, for. And, and the third is experts that typically support these two functions within a company. If you look at, if you look at the, the, uh, a company, you know, many people claim a company is about its people and it's about the culture. I, I think very, I'm, I'm a physicist. Uh, I think very empirically, a company is really its product and a product is really its supply chain. Right. And so, um, the, uh, the, the way to affect, um, what you are as a company is to change your product. And that means to change the supply chain. And I think that's, uh, that has been and will be forever the case. As long as we're making stuff, it's going to be, it's going to be, that's where we play. Right. I think the, yeah. the criteria you use to make those decisions have changed over time. In the past, it used to be energy efficiency because of costs. Uh, then it became yeah. uh, during the pandemic. This became supply and uh, you know, supply chain resilience. Um, uh, at the start of of uh, uh, this decade, we looked at all of these uh, these um, uh, claims and and pledges uh, to get to net zero. Um, there is a competition that uh, that um, that changed between 2018 and now. If you look at uh, the old motor space, the electronic space, I mean, wherever you look across the globe, there is a race unlike anything before. And I think there was right. uh, we we. Um, we kind of got distracted for for two years while while everybody was was panicked about uh, about uh, COVID. But um, but I think the the uh, the underlying theme of trying to figure out what's next, what's the next big thing that will drive innovation, that will drive investments, that will drive change, I think hasn't hasn't changed so significantly in these last four years. And that's a good thing, I must say. Being yeah. in this field for so long, I think um, I've seen three sustainability waves uh, come and go, and I think this is mm -hmm. this one's here to stay. The amount of here investment, to stay. I think it is. I love to hear that. I mean, it's it's a, you know, we needed to start yesterday. Yes, let's be honest. Yeah, right. So give us. A, we're going to do a deeper dive on <laughs> Maker's Site, but there's three key things that I want to talk to you about before we do those those that deep dive mm -hmm. give us a broad overview so who are you how are you helping to support your customers to address the challenges that you just mentioned mm -hmm. i think uh, uh, just to just to frame that challenge correctly right it is um it is a challenge of making trade-offs and mm -hmm. um there is business is eventually about making trade-offs i think if you look at it it's cost Environment and regulations. If you if you if you break this down into into its into its its core, it's that it's um, and and the people you're making trade offs for, or the the stakeholders you're making these trade offs for, is your supply chain, your development, your operations, your business, and your customers. Right? Uh, where do you where do you make it more expensive, and who pays for it? Where where are you creating the environmental damage, and uh, you know? Uh, how uh, how much in in how critical is that, um, and how much of it can you can you um, <laughs> blame others for in in some cases? Mm -hmm. I think it's about it's about making these kind of decisions in in small day to day iterations. There is no change that happens, uh, you know, where uh, where or let's put it differently. Change happens in very small increments. By the it small does. person who who says, you know, I'll make this screw out of aluminum instead of steel, or I've, mm -hmm. you know, I'm making a car and I, I I I remove the need for this particular this particular beam in the car, right? Small changes that make huge uh, huge difference when you when you scale it, and I think um, that's the the core problem that we try to solve. Now, in order to make these trade offs, you need a lot of data, and you need typically a lot of expertise. And these are two things that <laughs> are very scarce in, in industry today. I want to give you a, an interesting number. For every person like me, there are 4,000 engineers and, 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 and procurers that are yearning for decision support. Right? Wow. 4,000. So I need to find a way in my life to affect 4,000 people if this has right. to work. And that's what make aside solves it is it it changes the the equation where you do not need those number of experts you don't need the kind of data that uh, that we've needed until now um to solve this problem so what you do is you throw in a bit of material this is a definition of your problem your your product mm -hmm. um and yeah. make aside will principally read that and say well how do you make this stuff 
And right. once it figures out how you make this stuff, it will tell you, and this is the environmental impact associated with it. And this is how much it should cost yeah. to make. And this is where you could buy raw materials from and so on. Wow. So you're not just, you know, gut checking. No, no. <laughs> right? I think we've done that for way, way too long. Yes. Now, you mentioned those 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. Who is your ideal client? Like who is, if I'm in the audience listening mm -hmm. to this, who would I be to pick up the phone and call you? Mm -hmm. You're making stuff, firstly. Um, <laughs> you've got either very highly complex products or you've got mm -hmm. a va wide variety of products that you make. So these are usually very large companies um, at this point. Uh, you can, of course, apply it to, to smaller companies and to single products as well. But mm -hmm. we build Makersight to solve the problem of scale, right? So mm -hmm. there are expert tools that enable you to do small bits and pieces of what Makersight enables. There are costing tools. There are, you know, LCA and, and environmental analysis tools. Um, but the complexity that comes when you have very complex products or very complex organizations making products uh, hasn't been solved today. And that's where we we shine. Um, I think the kind of sectors that you're looking at um, uh, are a combination of sectors that are mature and sectors that uh, that have the data that you need to solve this problem at scale. Chemicals, automotives, uh, consumer goods and electronics, uh, construction. Um, these are, are great sectors to look for solutions like uh, uh, like Makersite. And I think the, uh, the, the main areas that we, we sell to in terms of functions within the company, I mentioned it's product development teams, procurement teams, very often supported by expert teams in costing or sustainability or compliance uh, or risk. Um, these are the teams that principally say, hey, you know, uh, management will will assign these experts the the job of solving the problem, but the problem is not really solved by coming up with an idea. You need a place, yeah. a, a way to implement this uh, as a system, and that's yeah. where 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 we do very well, very well. So walk us through an example, like mm -hmm. paint us a picture of uh, maybe the challenge that a customer has come to you with. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they sure. they worked with Makersite mm -hmm. as the solution, but what was the ROI and benefit to them? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do a deep dive into um, some particular aspects of the platform. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's uh, there's different use cases, but I'll pick I'll pick one uh, which is uh, which is Microsoft. Right? So these uh, happy to name them because they're also public. You can Google them um, and what they do with what they do with Makersite. And uh, the entire the entire problem they want to solve is uh, eco design in in a highly complex uh, uh, field of electronics and. Uh, um, and electrical devices. Um, how do you go about figuring out where to invest money to reduce impact? And uh, a majority of this impact actually happens in the use of these products. Of course, if you're looking at data centers, if you're looking at the Xbox or whatever that is, um, there is, however, a significant com component to this, which is in manufacturing, simply because of the mm -hmm. cyclicity of these products. And so the question is, how do you enable procurement and, uh, and product development to figure out what to bet on, what, what works and what doesn't work? Until now, it had, it, uh, so until Makersite, it had been a very tedious process. So getting to a result would take months, take experts to do, and principally you get these theoretical results that nobody can apply, right? So you say steel is better than aluminum, and then what does that mean? I mean, I'm yeah. I'm designing a chassis here, I'm designing a bracket here. Does it even make yeah. sense to worry about this? And um, what what we did was we scaled this. So we said, um, instead of spending uh, nine months evaluating an individual component, we did tens of thousands of components in a couple of months. Um, wow. And um, so last year. The year before last, we did 8 million LCAs. Last year, we, when numbers are not in, but we were close to 20 million LCAs of products. These are different components and uh, supply-specific uh, uh, information around uh, what's better and what's worse. Right? Um, and what, what the system does is it does, not, it does not force you to go in and find your answer. It actually it, it runs through all of the data that's presented to the system and says, well, these are the biggest drivers for change that you have. These are the biggest levers that you have to 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 optimize oh. for. That's I think that's that's cool. And um, in in terms of ROI, right? This is it's 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 crazy. It's hundred hundred times faster in terms of the process that they were using before. But I think that's not wow. that that's that's a that's a 
uh, it, it it takes away from the impact that you have in terms of scale, right? Because you right. can make it faster, but imagine doing this for everything that you're making and using, right? This is that scale is is ridiculous, and I think that's that's the you can repeat that story with almost any of our customers. Sometimes it looks at supply chain. Sometimes we're looking at uh, um, uh, at more at costing and trying to figure out, you know, where do you look at risk and cost and how do you optimize for that? In the current world of geopolitics, it is, it is of course, a problem. Uh, and then how do you do that, keeping in mind what the consequence is from an environmental, pers- environmental perspective? Mm. And doing this really quickly, imagine, imagine being able to do this across your entire portfolio. Most people can't imagine this, but across the yeah. entire portfolio of products in a couple of months, this um, that 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 kind of backlog clearance doesn't happen very easily, and that's what we no. what we do. Amazing! Thank you for sharing that story. I mean, you can just tell from that example, you know, even just the time. Like yes. you're making an impact um, by by partnering with MakerSite in a variety of different ways yeah. to the organization and the business goals, kind of no matter what that is. Yes. So let's do a bit of a deeper dive on the platform. Mm-hmm. Talk us through these three core things that you have on the platform. Let's mm-hmm. talk about each one of them in more detail. Mm-hmm. But firstly, let's start with automate your way to net zero. Now, <laughs> we are, you know, talking about net zero Mm -hmm. in a variety of different ways in this industry and you know there's different pathways to it there's different Mm -hmm. dates being put on it talk us through the operating system what it does and the benefits and how you're helping your customers automate their way Mm -hmm. to net zero i think it's uh, the framework has already been given to us right it's measure analyze and improve um i think in terms of uh of measurement one of the things that we're we're enabling is um how do you, if, if it's not just about what you measure, it's about how you measure it and that okay. it needs to be actionable, right? So yeah. today, if you want to calculate what your scope three carbon footprint is, uh, right, uh, in order to get to net zero, that's where you start. You can do this on a piece of Excel. Just, mm-hmm. you know, take the total amount of, uh, of money uh, that you're spending and uh, multiply that by uh, an emission factor, uh, and you get to an average number. You can't do anything with that number. There are there's right. a there's an entire variety of you know sophistications as you get from something as dumb as that to to really sophisticated stuff. But the key is you need to be able to measure stuff that enables decisions to change. Yeah. That's not easy, right? And that's no. that's what what we solve in. Typically, you would go in and you say, hey, we need to ask suppliers for these questions. But you know what? Suppliers are already providing a lot of the data that you already need. You right. just don't know how to use that. Twice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's that's what we solved. And I think this is this is a huge problem in in the evaluation of of impacts. Usually, forty percent of your time is spent on measurement on collecting this kind of information. We take that down to next to zero. Right. The second is in terms of analysis, and um, this is where this idea of you need an expert to find these insights is a problem, I would say. This mm-hmm. same ratio of one to 4,000, right? So these 4,000 people are buying and making all of the, uh, the, 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 the products you see on the market. I don't know if you know, but in manufacturing, 30% of, GD- of manufacturing GDP comes from new products. This means... Wow. New designs, new supply chains, and these yep. four thousand people that I'm supposed to be influencing are making that without my help right now, right? And that's right. that's uh, that's something to think about. But uh, this analysis needs to be automated, and that's where we use AI to uh, to figure out from the data that customers give us and the data that we have, what are these opportunities? What can you do that will get you to zero? What are the new technologies that are available? And if you were to apply them, right? If we were to say, hey, there's green cement, right? Um, how is it relevant for you? Do you even right. need cement? Do you have it in your supply chain, right? right? Or if there's green steel or if there's a green aluminum, what impact would adopting that technology have for you as a business? How could right. you get there? Usually this takes months, if not years to get to. Would make a side, this is in seconds. And what's more important is the insight doesn't appear at some board meeting in some PowerPoint. It happens while a person is seeing that 3D design and saying, hey, here's an idea. You could use this material instead. 
or when a yeah. procurement person is looking for a material with specifications and the principally the, the 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 system says hey here's an alternative material that has the same specifications with this much saving right so that's when we talk about analysis is is how we help and the third is in terms of improvement everybody has set these targets but very few people have a plan on how to get there and as soon as and, <laughs> very true i mean i was going to even ask you why net zero yeah. and maybe this has something to do with what you're going to yeah. say i think net zero is something that's that's a little that's a little um it's 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 almost a little it's a theoretical experiment right okay. practically there's no way to get to net zero um unless you look at offsetting as a, as one component of getting to zero right okay. net zero means you don't breathe right as a company you don't breathe you don't emit anything that's it's very very hard to do but i think as a mm -hmm. as a as a combination of what you what damage you do you offset that with something good i think this is possible this is this is possible but mm -hmm. you cannot just continue to operate as you do today and just buy credits in some place else that doesn't work we keep growing and there's a limit to this and that's this entire point of how do you plan for improvement how do you plan to wean yourself away right. from fossil fuels how do you plan to reduce the amount of waste you create uh, i don't know if you know did you know how much waste we generate from cradle from farm to fork i actually don't 70 percent number how much 70 percent of the food we produce oh. at the farm goes to waste mm -hmm. Until wow. until you have it on your plate, that's shocking. That should be shocking to us, right? That is. How do you reduce that? Is that? A huge number. Yes. And you're right. How do you reduce that? And how do you make those improvements? I mean, you spoke about earlier small steps. Yes. I think too many times we get focused on the word net zero. Yeah. And how overwhelming yes. that word is, and how overly impossible it seems to a lot mm -hmm. of people. Yes. Right. And until we break it down and we can figure out what those small steps and what my part yes. is out of those 4,000 people yes. and what I can do to do that. I think the other part of this that you, um, from what you were just talking about is the story. Mm -hmm. There's a story in every product. Yes. There's a story in a way that we create that product and how we look at the different components and how we think of the impact that each one of those components actually makes to the product, the story of the product, and then the story of the organization, which then turns into the story of the consumer and mm -hmm. how they are buying and how they're looking at product. Um, and then also, obviously, that is that so impact. funny you say that because I, I, I usually say this and people think I'm, I'm weird. I believe every product has a different life. Yeah, you know, you can make so a car, you. you can make the same car, but it will have a different life depending on where you sold it and who drives it and what they do with it at the end. Right. And if there's salt on the road, because it's <laughs> just saying, yep. <laughs> yeah, totally get it. It is it is that story, and it is it is what thought process went into making that and thinking about these things, um, uh, that uh, that that will decide. I think this step. It's net zero is like that light at the end of the tunnel. I would like to see it like that, right? It's the light at the end of the okay. tunnel that we need to go to, and every step has to be planned, right? Because we need to get there yeah. somehow. That's the that's the idea. Well, and that's where a lot of a lot of people, you know, falter mm -hmm. is how do we plan? Yes. How do we plan for that improvement, which is what you're talking yeah. about? Now, let's talk about accelerating product design. You have some impressive stats. I mean, you've already shared some impressive stats, but I think you have some more that you want to share with us. And I want to talk about how you're empowering manufacturers. Mm -hmm. You know, like why is it so important to shorten innovation cycles? Mm -hmm design better products faster because you've already talked about the components yes you know and finding the components that the, that can make the better impact mm -hmm. but why is it important for us to shorten and make it faster mm -hmm. as well so so uh, let's amazing amazing question and uh, let's let's put it this this way right um we now we're 2020 2022 but just to make the math simple uh, it's 2020 and uh, we want to we want to get to net zero by 2050 lots of co countries have pledged for this many companies have pledged for this um that's 30 years an average uh go to market for an innovation cycle for uh, for technology today is five to seven years mm. yeah what that means is if you're a, a, a car designer right you have five iterations at most mm. to make your car net zero 
That's right. a very shocking number, right? That is a very shocking number. <laughs> you could you be making you could be you could be making this mouse and in five iterations, you actually have five chances to change mm -hmm. the way mice are made to get them to zero. Right. And you can either you could either say, hey, I have five chances, I'm gonna I'm gonna pack the biggest punch into each of these these iterations, or you could try to shorten these iterations so you have more time. Right. Mm -hmm. You have even if you add another iterate iterative chance from five to six, that's a whole generation of products that you have uh, that you've created yeah. an opportunity for. So I think that's why time is is super critical here, right? In terms of mm -hmm. this this pace. And I think the even if you don't use climate change as a driver, right? There are I, I'm I'm I spent enough time trying to convince people that uh, that it's something uh, climate change is meaningful and it's real and uh, you know right. we need to do something about it. I, I don't do that anymore, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, I like to say there are there are different drivers, right? If you want talent, mm -hmm. there is there has never been anything else that so many young people are after than sustainability, right. investment. 80 trillion in investments earmarked for sustainable innovation, right? And companies wow. that can that can demonstrate ESG uh, um, uh, progress towards ESG. If you're looking at regulations, <laughs> whether it's in North America, Europe, rest of the world, it's tightening. If you're looking at competition, there's there's so many drivers to change. It just makes sense to make that change sustainable today. And I think that's. Yeah. Um, that's something to think about, right? We've never had this opportunity before. Absolutely. And we're talking about it so much more, but we need to. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, like I said earlier, we needed to do that yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you as well as I are very excited to see that we don't necessarily have to talk about it until we're blue in the face anymore. Yes. The numbers are showing it. The investment is showing yeah. it. The money is showing it. Yeah. Um, you know, consumer products the companies that mm -hmm. are, um, you know, putting forth these new innovations, these new products. Yes. And I mean, really, at the end of the day, the speed of knowledge and information is exponential. Think of it. Think of it, right? The automotive industry has not really innovated in 40 years. The yeah. cars that we, they, they've made it, they made it look a little better. They've increased the energy <laughs> efficiency, but there hasn't been in the powertrain. There isn't a fundamental change. There hasn't been one. Right. And then in five years, you had most of the big companies flip the switch and go electric. Electric. That's so in true. five years, right? Yeah. That is that must yeah. be shocking to people how fast things can yeah. change. I think that's yeah. that's the speed, and this is why if you and if you don't if you don't make it fast enough, you're out of business, right? That's uh, yeah, you're I out think. of the race. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's scary to a lot of people. Yeah. Now, um, I think some of the words for 2023 are risk and resilience. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how Maker's Site can um, support your clients, especially in resilience. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that. Why is that important? What are your customers saying about resilience mm -hmm. and how they're leaning on Maker's Site to really help them mm -hmm. um, with risk and resilience mm -hmm. in 2023? Mm -hmm. Uh, resilience is uh, uh, is the outcome of uh, or the, the reaction to disruption. And as we've seen in the last three years, there has been a lot of disruption and it continues. The main reasons for it are, of course, the kind of uh, geopolitical issues that we've seen and that we continue to see with Ukraine and mm -hmm. Taiwan and uh, Iran and uh, wherever you look, right, there's some problem or the other and people are more or less fed up with it because they've they've been burned pretty bad during COVID, which kind of which built on top of everything else. Um, and you saw huge disruptions in the automotive supply chains and the electronic right. supply chains and stuff in, in pharmaceuticals, in food and so on. Um, and this is why the, the degree of burn was so acute. I mean, this has always happened. There have always been disruptions. You have a geopolitical issue in one place and you, know, you don't get supply for a, for a certain period of time, but this usually resolved itself. Um, but um, given the accelerated pace at which it has been happening and the fact that we're not really seeing an end to it, frankly, um, has made procurement teams extremely wary of where they're buying stuff and, uh, and, and, and whom they're buying from. I think a lot of regulations, if you're looking at the U.S. with, you know, the the, the recent regulations around bringing chips home and uh, inflation reduction acts and what that means for for uh, globalizing supply chains. Again, 
um, I think this change or this 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 need to change your supply chain means that people want to either they want to build more resilient supply chains or they're building it because their supply chains are uh, uh, okay. need to be rebuilt because of regulations, right? But either ways, you're restructuring this, and people want to make sure that they don't make the they don't build the same deficiencies into their supply chain that they built during this process of global globalization. You know what's what's very interesting is 50 years ago, people knew exactly how their products were made. Then came this entire era of globalization where we could outsource right. a lot of that nonsense to other people to do. Yeah. And not seeing it. Exactly. And we didn't we didn't see what the impact was. We don't know what's happening there. And it's all unraveling now, right? So we're globalizing mm -hmm. where key processes are coming back home. And I think uh uh, the the what you focus on, what do you need to bring home, and monitoring this on a on an ongoing basis is what the what this next generation of of resilience products are about. Right. And I think one of the things to 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 keep in mind is that uh, resilience is not something that comes from one day to the next. Right. Mm -hmm. If you have a supplier that goes offline, there's not much you can do about it. If right. they were your only supplier, the thing is, how do you build resilience into your supply chain where you can see that coming? where you yeah. can look at where are the choke points in your supply chain and how do you build alternative secondary sourcing, right? Things like yeah, that. Pivot so quickly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, right. that's Pivoting. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and that's what these tools are are about. And I think it's a, it's a big theme. I think almost every company we speak with is doing something in this space. Unfortunately, it's a very, very, very hard problem to solve. And it's because, it yes. But it's so interesting, mm -hmm, yes. right? Because prior to the pandemic, supply chains were, you know, chugging along uh -huh. and everybody kind of did similar things. And now everybody's looking at it completely uniquely yes. for their organization, yes. where they want to spend their risk dollars, mm -hmm. where they don't want to spend their risk dollars. What does it mean for their company? But they also have the added sustainability, yes. right? Yes. The added DEI, diversity, yes. localization versus mm -hmm. globalization. Or do we move somewhere else yes. in Asia? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's so many different questions and there's so many things that supply chain professionals, procurement professionals need to um, solve or so kind of figure out mm -hmm. after two years of burnout. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's quite overwhelming, but I think it's really important for us to share tools um, in content like this, like Maker's Site, to really say, hey, this is out there. This is what can help you. Um, these are these are the solutions, right? Because a lot of times they have these challenges and they're not even sure what tool is out yes. there that can help them. And so this is why we do that show. And it's so important right now because that's what's going to support our people, keep our talent and keep supply chains moving. Yes, one of the one of the one of the uh, the three answers we get uh, when we when we present Maker Site are, who are you guys? Right. <laughs> the second the second is when we show them what we do, they're like, this can't be real. And the third reaction is, I didn't even know this could happen. Right. It's uh, and so uh, and so. Thank you for 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 giving us the, the time to 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 tell people yeah, what yeah, we yeah. do. It is um, it's um, it's always a great opportunity to share. And I think coming from this yeah. space, you know, it is people who who have been burned like me over time, where it just yeah. you work for twenty years and nothing changes or nothing significant oh. changes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you you get access to these tools. So me, I'm I'm my. I'm my best customer, really, because um, right. I, I just love what it does. Yeah, and I can see your passion. Now, one question I have for you, um, I have two more questions. But really quickly, especially with technology, a lot of people are like, what does the onboarding look like? Can you tell us really quickly how easy it is to work with you? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you can actually take Naked Sight and start using it yourself, right? So there's, uh, okay. there's a two-hour onboarding and you can start using it. But this is not where the real value is. The real value is when you train our AI to understand your products. Okay. And that's a setup time that takes uh, about three months to do um, okay. for very large. So we work with enterprise customers. So these are yeah. hundreds of thousands of components and uh, different supply right. chains and thousands and thousands of suppliers and stuff like that. So uh, the, the, the largest I think we've done is uh, two million components uh, in, their, in their supply chain. Two wow. million components. I mean, nobody even that's thought about lot. that. 
um, uh, uh, close to close to 70,000 suppliers. And um, wow. that takes three months to do. So if you've got a smaller supply chain, it's of course faster. But the key part of yeah. that is taking your data and training our AI to say, hey, you know, do we recognize this kind of component? Do we re recognize this kind of material? Do we know how to make it? And training the system yeah. to be able to do that. I think that's uh, that's that's what it takes. And after that, there are there are deployments where there is no user on the system, actually. Makersite wow. does the math and principally submits results directly into um, the tools that users use today. And I think that's yeah. what's amazing, right? So we don't need to bring people to yet another tool to do analysis. Our, right. our entire concept is if you want to scale this, it needs to be in the hands of tools that are currently in use, CAD systems, right. PLM systems, ERP systems. And so very often our data just gets crunched and piped back through into the systems that users use. Amazing. But I mean, three months to save, you know, multiple, mm -hmm. multiple months on the back end. Yes, yes, really, yes, yes. You know, is, is not a big deal. So now quickly, you know, tell us what's the future of Makersite? What can we, you know, see from you coming up? I think you will see us um, as the Intel inside in very many, very many systems. Uh, Autodesk, for example, we're, we're going to be uh, launching our, our beta uh, integration into the tool, which allows engineers to... Um, to to in real time understand what are the implications of the choices that they're making across cost and uh, and sustainability, uh, and you'll see this across many different other tools as well, um, uh, where we want to provide this intelligence where it's needed, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and not try to avoid this massive change because Makerside is a system that sometimes makes you rethink how you do stuff, how you you organize the process of innovation and procurement. Um, we don't want to uh, to add change on top of change. So our, our approach is do it slowly, do it implicitly uh, in the systems that you currently use and just make the information available to you. By, by doing that itself, engineers, they love data. They usually pick this up. Um, I think uh, you, you'll see more and more of that. And I think you'll see more and more uh, in terms of, uh, of scale, right? So our mission mm -hmm. is um, to get to a billion supply chains, to simulate a billion supply chains by 2025. Wow. Um, that's a big number. That's and a very I big number. I can't wait to see how you make that happen. So definitely go and check them out at makersite.io. And I mean, as we look towards Q2 and beyond, it's clear that procurement and supply chain teams have plenty of challenges ahead. You know, from outdated technology and high levels of complexity to a lack of visibility and ambitious sustainability demands, how can organizations really tackle so much all at once? Well, Makersite can help. You can make sustainability, cost, and risk decisions on a single platform, allowing you to design better products faster, build supply chain resilience, and automate your way to net zero empowering you really to make 50 times faster product and supply chain decisions, investing in the maker's site platform is really just a no brainer. Neil, this has been so insightful. You bring so much value to the industry and I'm so glad that you could join us for this episode today. So thanks to your team for making it happen. And thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me.